Hello and welcome to Ice Dice. My name's Evan and this is Mike. Hello. And today we're going to be looking at some oddities from Mike's basement. Um, the first game we're going to look at is from 1968, Dynamite Shack. It comes from Milton Bradley and it's a dexterity game where the theme is that you are dynamite handling giants with freakishly, freakishly large and alarmingly pink Thumbs. That is correct. Uh, what can you tell me about this game? Well, Evan, as you well know, the 60s and 70s were a peak time for wacky board game ideas from America's top mass market board game producers. It is no coincidence this is also a peak time for wacky commercials directed towards the kids, of which I was one. We were a captive audience, and as long as the commercials could grab our attention on Saturday mornings, we were hooked. This was also the time of clackers and pop rocks and illegal toys such as jarts and easy bake ovens. How much fun the game met was, of course, mattered, but what also matters just as much was the audacity of the product. So, ideal games back during the day had the marble games with marbles in them, and Aurora was rocking the big, huge, giant games with the pendulum thing. So, also the around that time was mousetrap, and mousetrap raised the stakes on the big wacky games. So Milton Bradley just had a big hit with Operation a few years before. So kids, kids they wanted the excitement and the fun. Milton Bradley responded in 1968 by introducing something called the Dynamite Shack. Other games they released that year were Don't Break the Ice and something called Stump. So the first reaction I received when showing this game to anyone is a combination of shock and disbelief. Even for a board game designer, I mean collector such as myself, it doesn't look to be a collection, a continuation of the wacky board game ideas as much as it is like a board game designer suffering from PTSD. So, you know, like you said, it's just a simple dexterity game where plastic pieces are dropped into a, a ticking mechanism. This thing is ticking. The first player to get rid of all their little dynamite pieces wins. So far, simple enough. But wait, there's more. The ticking mechanism in this case was this is this little red plastic box labeled with a black roof labeled the dynamite shack. Okay, so far it might be a little bunch for kids, but it still could be fun. So the plastic pieces in this game are shaped like sticks of dynamite. The game also comes uh, with cards noting directions as to which dynamite piece you're supposed to throw in the in the dynamite shack. So if the ticking mechanism pops the roof off the uh, house while the player is uh, attempting to put the dynamite pieces in the roof, then they have to take all the dynamite pieces that have fallen through so far back into their collection and start again. So the game is basically the player who is best at filling the uh, the roof with the dynamite pieces uh, when the pieces are gone wins the game. So far, it's a silly little, little game with enough of a mild scare for kids to be considered fun. But wait, there's more. What elevates this game into the upper, upper echelon of board game nonsense is the means by which to drop the dynamite pieces into the dynamite shack. I imagine that conversation went something like this in 1968. Milton, I tell you, what a big hit with this operation. With the funny bone and the broken heart and the red nose with the glowing and the buzzing. This one, this one, it needs to be baffo. Now. We have the ticking check where the roof flies off. That's great. How are the kids going to get the pieces of dynamite into the roof there? Oh, Bradley, man. Maybe we toss it in there, man. Rubber bands, catapults. You know, kids like throwing pieces. Newton, you're way off. Look at that little hole in the roof. Your kids can't throw pieces in there. It's not going to work. Why don't you uh, tap into your uh, groovy lifestyle that we're accustomed to here in the 1968 and come up with an alternative way to put the uh, uh, dynamite into the, the, the dynamite shack there. Hey, man, I just had a vision, man. It's like a giant psychedelic dream in which... Giants with great big purple and pink thumbs, man. Transport the evils of war into a, into the war machine, man. No, you crazy hippie. You've done it. You've figured out the key is the giant pink thumbs. 
giant pink thumbs. We make giant pink thumbs for kids to put over their regular thumbs. And they drop the dynamite in the shack with the giant pink thumbs. Giant pink thumbs, Milt Bradley. I mean, Milt. <laughs> giant pink thumbs. It does make it hard. I, that's, uh, add something to it. Um. So, in conclusion, the game of Dynamite Shack is a testament to everything that is both insane and marvelously wacky and fun about the board game industry in the 1968. These do make it hard. Uh, you ever seen the movie Cowgirls Get the Blue? Blues? Blues. No. You, you, don't, you know of it? No. no, it's Uma Thurman, and it's based on a novel. And the main character in the novel has freakishly large thumbs. And so what she does, she goes hitchhiking. And it's one of those spiritual growth things. But um, I actually, when I saw this game, I went and looked, and it's like the novel that the movie is based on came out in 1971. I really do wonder if the guy saw the commercials on the TV and says, hey, I'm going to write a novel about a character with giant thumbs. Are, were that what did they have a distinctive color in the in the cowgirls? No, no, they were just, they just didn't have this. They were just just giant. Um, that's all there was. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> so the next game is from 1959, Pinhead. This game is from Remco, and it's uh the theme is hide and seek and microcephaly. It's really just a roll and move game. That's all there really is to it. So you know, as an amateur uh, board game historian as well as a collector. One publishing company stands above all others in consideration as to the weakest attempt to capitalize on the fun of the board game industry. That company's name is Remco. Remco Toys was a New Jersey company that published both games and toys from 1955 to 1991. Although they had a long run, None of their games were that were that successful, and even fewer still were well received. They are or were sort of the K-tell of the board game world. So the game Pinhead is typical fare for Remco, although not the worst example of their games. They had far, far worse games. So published in 1959. This is a roll and move game with a little plastic box that acts as a uh, hide and seek mechanic. And so you guess is one of the two numbers in the plastic box and that's all it is. The full title of the game is Pinhead, the game of hide and seek. Although it has little to do with hide and seek and possibly less to do with any particular pinhead other than... Well, there's, the, one, there's one right, that's what you're looking for. He's right at the finish line. <laughs> there he is. That is, a, that is indeed a pinhead. Wearing is, makeup, <laughs> but it looks like a boy. I'm not sure what the deal is. <laughs> so even a perfunctory study of the Remco line shows... Uh, very quality workmanship. I mean, very poor quality workmanship and shoddy quality of the games. I mean, the name of the game at the Remco seems to be instead of getting games that kids will want to play, uh, is to produce product in front of people who would want to buy stuff for kids to play. You know, it's it's very uh, ugly marketing ploy. So it's it's like uh, uh, when you were at a county fair or something like that. You, the, the name of the game there is, once they have the money, they could care less. So that basically seems to be the motto of, of the Remco is, hey, we've got your money, move along, sucker, instead of their actual motto, which is, as it's printed on every box, every boy wants a Remco toy. And so do girls. Because, of course, you can't leave out half your intended audience. So Remco, Pinhead, not their worst game, not their best game, just a... Bad, bad marketing ploy is most of the Remco line. It is really cheap. Cheap. Bad cheap. They use three color printing on the front, but then on the sides they only do two color printing, and they didn't even pay to print the back. Um, but the game is bad. bad. I, mean, I can just tell. Because here's what, how it works. I looked, I read the rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course you did. So what it has is the, the hide-and-seek part supposed to be this box that has dice, and so you put the dice in there. Oops. You put the dice in there, and you roll, and then you say, I want to look at this one, or I want to look at that one. Yeah. Completely pointless to gameplay. I mean, you, you have no information, so... But there's more. Yeah. Um, they have these tag your it spots on here. Mm -hmm. When you land on those, you don't do anything. You sit there and wait until someone else lands on the holes, on the spot. So it's a roll and move game, except sometimes 
you don't get a role in a movie. You just get to sit there and watch other people play. That sounds like fun to me. <laughs> it's not. Does it? Does it have anything to do with hide and seek? Well, this is the hide and seek part. And you're looking for the pinhead. You know, and I'll tell you this about this whole pinhead thing. Yeah. You know, it, it is an um, actual um, condition that people have called microcephaly, yeah. where their skulls are down. And this is, this is the, uh, this is, I'm sure people whose children have that condition don't like them to um, call pinhead. I think in today's, this would be about the same as coming out with retard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's just, it's horrible. It's just as offensive. Well, um, well, continuing the kind of fair theme, they don't have that anymore. Where they like look at the freaks because who would do that in 2015? Hey, I'm, I have uh, facial hair and I'm a woman. Look, I'm you know instead of just like oh we sympathize, you know power to the people. It's like no point around and, and call her a freak. I mean it's horrible. No, I think it's more that people won't pay for it because they can just look at it on the internet. <laughs> I, I think that probably is more what it is. Um, but yeah, I mean that's you know I I say it's offensive. Oh, but, no, but, no, but it's straight up. There's also that Zippy the Pinhead comic that's gone on for 20, 30 years. That thing's been going. So maybe it's, maybe it's not quite as offensive, but... Microcephaly? Microcephaly. Microcephaly. But it is, the back of their skull does not grow as it's supposed to, so it, it, it uh, um, inhibits their brain development. Wow, I did not know that's the actual... Yeah, yeah. You never saw the movie do. Freaks, 1939? Gaba, 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 Gaba. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, they had a couple, uh, a couple of them in there. Um... Yeah, I guess that's all there really is to say about this game. It's a terrible, horrible thing. Okay, well, uh, the next game is Baboon Ball from 1981. Um, this is from Hasbro, and the theme is Baboons Bashing Balls for Bananas. What can you tell me about this game? Well, I'm a board game fan as well as a uh, board game collector, so naturally the main reason I game, want games in my collection is there are uh, games of which I'm also a fan. The most obvious fan criteria is uh, whether the game is good or fun to play with other people. Other games are praised due to their rarity or oddity. However, we do have a few games in our collection that I'm a fan of based on blatant idiocy. The games are bereft of originality or fun or strategy. Just a blatant ploy to get bought since the game sounds like it's so, so it's based on completely on the name of the game. Such is the case with a baboon ball. The mechanics are the exact same as those in your um, uh, tabletop hockey games that you played. When you kids, you played the tabletop hockey. Yeah, game. I I everybody's that. played the tabletop hockey. But instead of using the pucks, this wing just uses balls. That's it. That's the entire thing. So. Ball, so um, that's the whole thing. So you put some indentations in each corner of the game, and you spin around and you try to score goals. That's the whole thing. Who cares? It's a baboon ball. That seems to be the whole thing. I, I mean, I wasn't at Hasbro in 1981, but from looking at the game and understanding the era in which the game originated, I'm pretty sure the creative process pretty much stopped after they came up with the name baboon ball. Uh, so something to the effect of, you know, guy just end of the day all tired going, oh, Christ, you know, um, isn't that Clint Eastwood just come out with a monkey movie with the, with the orangutan? Is anything rhyme with orangutan? Can we, can we put that in the title? The orangutan, monkey, something? Uh, that's a, uh, hey, baboon, that, that's a fun word, baboon. Uh, baboon, b uh, balloon, baboon. Ball, baboon ball. There, that's it. I'm done. I'm tired. Let's close up shop. I'm stuck. Let the baboon ball. Let marketing take the rest of it. That's my. Oh, it's. I'm done. Oh, that's as much effort as I'm going to put into this product. I'm at Hasbro. It's 1981. Oh. Well, I, I actually think that this did not start with the name. I think it started with the mechanic and the design. Someone came up with the design, and you know we actually played it. It does kind of work. It works. I mean, it's 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 we we played, and you actually were upset when you lost the game. Don't lie, you were. Um, <laughs> Genuinely, we was. only played to Genuinely one point. Was. So it's fun for three minutes. Yeah, but really, the, you want to know why I think there's there's two reasons why I think they came out with this game. Number one is Hungry Hungry Hippos was ah. a huge success, and it's not just the, the animal part. I don't think that's really got anything to do with it, but the big plastic thing. So the other part, whether this game is fun or not, doesn't matter because you get those uncles and aunts that are buying games at Christmas time. They look at this and go, wow, look at that. That looks cool. I bet it's fun. And then they buy it without putting much thought into, you know what, it's probably not really that much fun. 
All right, point taken. But I am saying alliteration is literally 60% of the entire capacity of this game. It's just um, the alliterative, like you said in the, in the start, the, the, with the bees and the bees. Alliteration, baboon ball, that's 60% of it. And you're saying it's I'm way overselling the, the, just the alliteration. I'm saying that the design probably came before the name. Oh, well, uh, we will agree to just, well, we can't go back to 1981 and figure that out on a time machine, but I will beg to differ. Well, but it makes more sense, because it's, it's, it seems a lot more sense if someone said, hey, look at these plans I have for this game, and they go, yeah, yeah, oh, what are we going to call it? Rather than, oh, let's come up with a name, hey, somebody, make up some designs for us, you know, some engineering, some, put it out there, that just doesn't seem likely. I tell you, he went to the Clint Eastwood movie, he thought it was funny, his kids thought it was funny, he's like, ah, we got to come up with something yeah. It could be. Well, anyway, that's Baboon Ball, uh, 1981 uh, dexterity hockey type game. Yeah. Okay. So the last game is uh, the Spiro T. Agnew American History Challenge game from 1971. This comes from Gabriel, and the theme of it is pretty much a corrupt politician cloaks himself in patriotism, and it's a it's a trivia game. I mean, you have a spinner, and uh, you you pick some cards and you answer trivia questions. Well. All right, Spiro T. Agnew, as everybody, not now, you history people know, is the only vice president to resign due to criminal activity. However, two years before that, he put on a board game. Oh, well, he didn't. Some person named Glenn T. Remington did. This was Glenn's actually only claim to fame, his only published item. Very little is known of this Glenn T. Remington. Uh, just like Spiro, he has passed on, so we will never know. So, who cares? Why even bring this up? The game itself is not that interesting. It's just a boring American history game with questions just like, sort of like, based, you know, like, a much like go to the head of the class. But this one's just based on American history. No, the allure of this game lies in its timing and hubris. So, time in 1972, Richard Nixon just got reelected to his second term as president of the United States with Spiro T as his vice president. Normally, vice presidents in this country tend to keep a low profile. Joe Biden, of course, being an exception. But Spiro T wasn't having any of that. He wanted his face on a board game. Or maybe somebody he associated with him did. Even though uh, deals weren't made, deals were made until in 1971, they came out with something called Spiro T. Agnew American History Challenge. Well, that probably wasn't said like that, but can you even imagine? The delight of a young child as he runs down and sees this person's face on a board game. Oh, sock it to me. <laughs> uh, sock it to me is a reference from laughing from... I know. It's a dated reference. I admit it's a dated reference. And it doesn't apply because it's not Spiro T. Agnew that said it. Well, his, 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 boss, much, his boss. His boss. Okay, all right. You're right. It's, it's horribly. It's horrible. It's a horrible joke. So, sure, this is a horribly dry trivia game, but on the cover is someone who is actively being tried during the, during this time and, and, and for corruption for and will soon leave lives his office in disgrace. So, other than... Ugly footnote in history. At least we have this exciting board game to remember him by. Well, at least I have this exciting board game to remember by. And according to the internet, at least 10 other people in these United States or the world have this board game. 10 other people at least have this board game to remember by. So I say, God bless America and God bless you, Spiro T. <laughs> You know, um, being from Minneapolis, you know that the other president, there actually was a vice president who resigned before that. You know who that was? Mm. Oh, you should know. I don't. Because, not because he's from the area, but because the, probably the most popular lake within the city limits of Minneapolis is... Calhoun? Lake Calhoun. And it's named after the vice president. He resigned because he was very pro-slavery, and the administration was moving anti-slavery, so he resigned. So periodically in Minneapolis, like every five to ten years, people get together saying, we should change the name of that lake to be against that slavery guy and it never goes anywhere but he wasn't he wasn't actually fond of any criminal actual criminal no, no. activity he, he, he was just spiro, spiro he, he was he, just a jerk spiro t he, he wouldn't have went to the big yeah, house but no that was the first game um but you know he said this actually is more than trivia questions um I, when he brought this out i, I quickly yeah. went through the rules first of all they say well you know the the, the trivia questions are meant to be hard because mm -hmm. otherwise you'll just get them the first time you get it but they also have bonuses they have bonuses like where you have to recite things 
like they'll say, um, I, I'm guessing, recite the, the Gettysburg Address or the first few lines. They also have, like, sing the first stanza of God Bless America, and you can move ahead five spaces. So I, I tell you, if they have singing, that takes away some of the dryness. But all right, all it's right. Still, it's still not anything anybody's ever going to want to play. <laughs> no, ever. That's the whole point. It's just this ugly, ugly footnote in history that ten other people have in the world. Uh, I spoke according to the Internet, and I, I'm one of them. So, But look at this board. I mean, he must be a great American. It's got both stars and stripes on it. Dang. <laughs> Only a true patriot would design a game like that. Okay, but this is way before Internet. Or, so somebody literally had to write a letter to... Spiro saying, hey, Spiro, I'm Glenn T. Remington. I designed this board game. I want to assassinate your name to it because you're a great American. I love you. I'm sorry you're going to be I'm sorry you're going to be arrested in a couple of years and, and forced to resign. I don't think he said I love you. I think he did XXX O O O. Yeah. I mean it's the vice president for crying out loud. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you don't know, Spiro T, I mean, he was bribery. He yeah, was, yeah, he was bad. He, he's right? lucky he didn't go to prison. But this, you know, this would sort of be like, except for the whole having to resign part, um, it's not like coming out with Biden the American. It's more like Cheney the American history game because, you know, Cheney's the same sort of hardcore yeah, conservative yeah. and saying, yeah, look at this, American trivia, play it. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, well, that's uh, it for this edition of Oddities for Mike Spaceman. I'm sure we'll do another one every now and then. He's got a lot of games in the basement. A lot of weird stuff down there. See you next time. See ya.